Okay, today I'm building a tempering bath system to accommodate various container sizes. I will mainly follow instructions mentioned by Nicholas on his blog post about the thermostated water bath. The link to his post appears at the bottom of the screen. You can copy it for reference. So thank you, Nicholas. Today I'm just going to show how to set it up. We need a temperature controller. It's easy to find one. Several online dealers are referencing a few of those. We'll also need a 300 watt beverage heater or immersion heater. It's just a big heating resistance, like the ones found in electric kettles most of the time. Then we need a wall power socket to plug the immersion heater in. And obviously some copper core electric cable. Finally a box to install everything in. Here I will sacrifice a heavy duty extension cord to make the power supply for this whole thing. As stupid as it may sound, it is cheaper than making one from scratch at least in my area. The operation principle is as follows. The digital temperature controller measures the temperature via its thermocouple sensor and compares it to reference temperature entered by the user on the controller panel. When in heater mode, if the measured temperature is below the reference temperature, the controller closes up a switch and allows the current to go through the heater, so the heater warms the bath. When the temperature is greater than the reference one, the controller opens the switch, which cuts the current, and then the heater stops warming the bath. Okay, I don't live in a country where you can sue someone for having, on your own, burnt yourself with hot water. But given the state of the global economy, it might get to us not too long from now. So for all intents and purposes, you are on your own. If you mess it up and electrocute yourself, or else, it's your fault, not mine. <laughs> Sorry, I know, <laughs> I'm a bastard. Personally, I'm not fond of electricity in wet environments, for obvious reasons. So for the box, I chose a semi-waterproof electrical junction box. What takes quite some time is the fitting of all elements into the box. The wiring you'll see is quite quick in comparison. First, I will install the power socket on top of the box, where I will plug in the heater. So I take measures, I draw a few lines, and I drill holes all along the perimeter. So here we are, all this mumbling for that. Same thing for the controller that I place on the other side of the junction box to avoid having wires on top of each other. To make the whole thing relatively waterproof, well, water projection proof really, uh, I will certainly have some silicon sealant around the controller and power socket when this video is over. Regarding the wiring, it's quite simple. I just follow the wiring diagram that comes with the controller. The NTC label refers to the thermocouple sensor. Regarding the wires through which the current of the heater will pass, one needs to choose wires with a fair cross-section in order to avoid overheating inside the junction box due to undersized wires for the load. For reference, P equals U times I. With P, the power, we have here 300 watts, so with a voltage of 220 volts, we have a bit more than one ampere. 1 ampere is quite a lot already, so I follow the rule of thumb which considers quite reasonable 1 ampere by square millimeter of copper cable cross section. In order to keep some room for potential future use of heaters with a different load, I'm using 2.5 square millimeters cross section cables. So these are fairly rigid cables. I use a blue cable for neutral and a brown or red cable for live or phase. On the diagram, I connect my neutral on input terminal 4, so these are 1, the blue wire from the mains power supply, and 2, the blue wire which goes to the heater power socket. And on input terminal 3, I connect my phase, or live, so these are 1, the brown wire from the mains power supply, and 2, the red wire which goes to the controlled switch on input terminal 1, and which goes out on output terminal 2 from the controlled switch towards the heater power socket. So the heater power socket will be supplied with electricity here through my blue wire, the neutral and my red wire, the phase or live. Therefore, the heater will be plugged in here and will be de facto supplied with electricity or not when the controlled switch will be closed or opened. Then what is left to do is putting everything in the junction box and connecting the heater power socket in which I also connect the earth from the mains power supply. I close everything. Now we just need to check that everything works according to plan. Just about time for me to read the instruction manual. 
It switches on, it's already a good start. The display shows the temperature measured by the thermocouple sensor. 25 degrees. It's quite hot in here due to halogen lamps needed to light the table for the video. I check first that the thermocouple sensor works properly, so I bring it near the halogen lamp and we can see it goes up quickly. Blowing on it helps it going down, more slowly of course. All is A-OK on this side, let's carry on. I now want to check the control switch. I will check it with a light bulb as it's obviously easier to see. It's the light bulb I use as an inactinic light for the collagen development procedure. It's only a decorative bulb, nothing fancy. Yeah, it's a wonder of technology, really. So here is the sensor indicating 26.7 degrees Celsius. 25 is my reference for the controlled switch in heater mode. It's below 26.7, so the switch is opened, normal. And if I raise the reference to 30 degrees, the switch now closes itself and the bulb is lit. Pure magic, it works. As expected, we need it to heat to reach 30. To check whether the thermocouple breaks the circuit as soon as we reach 30 degrees, I place it once again near the halogen lamp. It goes up fast and clack. At 30, the circuit breaks. It takes a bit longer to cool down, as expected. And when we go below 30, it switches on again. It's not immediate because there's a latency. The controller doesn't do measure every second. The precision can be adjusted, but it can vary depending on the control type or brand. But for my intended use, it's quite enough. I will show in another video what is the intended use for this tempering bath system at least for my use. Let's do a lab test now, a self-tempered bath. It's obvious that the water close to the heater is hotter than the one farther from it. So to properly mix it, we only need a small submersible water pump like the ones found in aquariums. I want to warm my bath at 30 degrees, so I enter 30 for the reference temperature. We can clearly observe that from 30 up, the small red indicator light is switched off, telling us the heater is switched off too, but the temperature keeps on rising. It's normal again because the heater is still quite hot and it's enough to warm the bath just a little bit more. It's then very clear that for a much better precision, it is important to calibrate factors like the controller latency and the power of the heater as a function of the bath volume. In short, calibration will help in achieving greater accuracy. So there you go, all what you need to have to build a self-sustained tempering bath. You need the temperature controller and its thermocouple sensor, a travel beverage heater or warmer called also an immersion heater and a small submersible pump. See you!